Well, the haters gonna hate, 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 and the fakers gonna fake, 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 baby. I'm just gonna make, 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 making luck, making luck. A dummy podcast. Yeah. 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 Welcome to Making Luck, <laughs> a Dominion podcast. A Dominion podcast. My name is Adam, and this is Jake. Hi, Jake. How you doing? Hey, I'm pretty good, Adam. Um, so, uh, sorry we're a little late with the episode, yeah. um, a little later than normal, but uh, I didn't have a voice for the last couple of uh, days. Yeah, it's been pretty rough. Yeah, like I like every other word just wasn't coming out. It was pretty cool. Yeah. So we decided that uh, a podcast that relies on its audio to carry it would probably something be something that we shouldn't do. While one of the hosts has only half of a voice. Right. And um, it would... I mean, you'd have to really struggle to understand me. So it'd be like a normal episode of Making Luck in that respect. But yeah, um, it's much better this way where um, you'll only have to sort of struggle to understand me just because what I'm saying doesn't make any sense. But you'll be able to hear the words. Yeah. So then you'll at least be able to make fun of him on the Dominion Discord, which is uh, right. really all that that is for, right? Just making fun of people? Or just us? Uh, I think it's just you. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. But since you're my alt. So. Uh, right, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. That's right, forgot. So, uh, <laughs> last time on Making Luck, a laryngeal podcast, uh, we... What the hell did we do last time? I don't remember. We what talked we about talking? inheritance. We talked about inheritance. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, so I had I had one note that I wanted to go over based on some feedback from yeah. the last episode. Um, we, we was, I was talking about uh, a couple of gotchas with inheritance, how like Crossroads and Outpost might not work the way you expect them to because they reference the card name. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> it turns out that someone... I, I thought I had them all, and I said, nah, I think I might have them all. It turns out someone found one that I didn't get. Uh, this one actually costs four or less, so it's okay. a lot more relevant than outposts. So I feel like I should mention it. Yeah, go for it, man. Do you do you know what it is? Oh God, uh, let me see if I can figure it out. Um, what's a four? Or... It's treasure. Is map. it urchin? It's treasure. No, map. or why would it be urchin? <laughs> okay, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It gets the types. <clears throat> so the the types and the attack type is fine. It's treasure. Why map. would you inherit treasure map? But yeah, okay. well, if I could inherit treasure map and have three T maps in my deck right away, that would actually be amazing. Yeah, if you could open with it, sure. Or get it like any time <laughs> soon. Like, that would actually be really good. Unfortunately, Treasure Map has to trash two Treasure Maps. So you can't trash an estate Treasure Map to a real Treasure Map. Yeah. And if you trash either one of them being an estate and not named Treasure Map, you don't get the goldiness. So if you play an estate Treasure Map, um, are you, you're not allowed to trash the two estates in your hand then? Or well, you're going to trash the estate you played because Treasure Map says trash this on it. Or, or do you trash an estate in your hand too? It says trash this and another Treasure Map. So if you had like a real Treasure Map in your hand, you could trash that. <laughs> but but estate tra- is not Treasure Map. It's huh. not named Treasure Map. So you can't trash the other estate. That's really weird. And if you trashed even another Treasure Map with your estate, um, it wouldn't work because it says if you trash two Treasure Maps. Man, like, with Inheritance, we really went down the rabbit hole of, like, weird Dominion rules logic. Yeah. Like, I... We didn't even do that in the Overlord episode, and that... Right. Or the Procession <laughs> one. And God knows we... Procession has quite a few weird things yeah. going on when you... Pl- I Procession a Golem. I don't know what happens. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Let the computer <laughs> figure it out. Yeah. Um, yeah, so... That's pretty cool. Yeah, so that, that's, a, that's a thing that happened. Yeah. And uh, also, uh, before we get to the kingdom from last episode, I guess we should say what we're talking about this time, right? Yeah, we have a user submitted, or a listener submitted um, a topic. We A while ago, somebody asked us to cover, like, what do you do when there's no X? And, like, X is, like, what do you do when there's no draw or plus buy or uh, things like that. So we're going to go over some of the different things that may or may not be missing from a kingdom that are usually really important to your strategy and uh, how you play around it, how much you play around it, and what it might mean for your deck building. Yeah. So with that in mind, uh, actually, the kingdom from last time, I think, is somewhat relevant. Yeah. Because there was no draw. 
Yeah, yeah. And it's, that was a big deal. It was a very different kingdom because there was no draw. That's definitely. right. So uh, why don't you why don't you slap down some cards for me? Yeah, I'll slap them right on you. Um, so I'm gonna slap Adam first with University, Chariot Race, Lookout, Ironworks, Nomad Camp, Capital, Charm, Duke, Groundskeeper, Expand, and we had the event Inheritance. What's more for our audio-only listeners, we had University, Chariot Race, Lookout, Ironworks, Nomad Camp, Capital Punishment, Charm, Duke, Groundskeeper, Expand, and we had Inheritance. Right. Good old capital punishment. <laughs> Good old capital punishment. Old I mean, it feels, like, it feels like capital punishment the next turn. Like, you play it, and it's like, this is great, and then the next turn you're like, capital punishment, because <laughs> I have all this not death. great yeah. anymore. <laughs> yeah. It feels bad. Yeah. Uh, so. So I think last time uh, I was advocating, I mean, there were there are two decks you can build here, right? You can go Dutchy Duke, or you can thin with Lookout and go for points, VP tokens, with Groundskeeper and Chariot Race. Yeah. And I waffled a bit, but I think I decided uh, you want to go for the VP token thin deck, because... Um, I felt like that just would overtake Dutchy Duke, even though I thought Dutchy Duke was pretty strong. Yeah. And then I think I advocated for uh, a lookout opening, but if you have four on your first turn, then you get the Nomad Camp and you hope to hit five. And yeah, I wasn't right. quite sure why, but it turns out that that's good anyway. Yeah, so I, I definitely agree. The turn one Nomad Camp was super good here. Uh, and the five that you're going to buy is capital. Right, if you're going for that deck... You want to get a capital in the deck because uh, if you can open with a capital, then you have a very high chance of hitting seven on turn three or turn four, getting your inheritance right away. Then you don't really have to worry about trashing those estates or going for the inheritance because now you have yeah. three estate chariot races in your deck. Your deck right. is super way better. Yeah, it's it's really good. I mean, you just still uh, want to gain and play lookouts. You probably, even in that situation, want two at least, because you want the... Like, right. once you have the cherry races, the coppers need to go. Yeah. Um, so... The tribe is spoken. Yeah. Uh, that tech was... Oh, by the way, I just want to apologize in advance. I'm going to sound a little gross, um, I think. Mm. <laughs> like, I... There's really no getting around that. Um, <laughs> I was... I was sick enough that we're still in the aftermath of it. So, bear with me. But, um... Yeah, the... Uh, the deck that... I. Uh, that is playing the chariot races definitely wants to thin very aggressively. Uh, right, getting the coppers out is a big deal. But <coughs> also, because there's no draw on this board, um, you're really looking. I mean, we'll get to it in more detail in this episode. But the short version is you're looking to the cantrips to be able to do your business. Yeah, and the cantrips here are conveniently the things that give you VP tokens, which is why this deck works well. Yeah, but uh, you want to be gaining lots of chariot races and playing them and making them good. And also with the groundskeepers, and I want to be playing a lot of those, and so I need to get past those coppers. The only way to do that here is to trash them. Yeah, and the other thing that is really good about that deck, um, and particularly focusing on the groundskeeper, is that um, ground, part of the strength of groundskeeper is that buying groundskeepers is kind of like delayed scoring in a way. It's like you have the groundskeepers in your deck, and having the capacity to get those points is kind of like having the points. If you have the groundskeepers in your deck, like you can kind of count yourself as having some points, because when you do green, it's just going to be that much uh, more impactful. But they don't hurt your reliability at all. And the decks that are uh, really weak on draw, like here, that are using cantrips as the only plus cards, um, they really hurt for reliability, especially when they start greening. So getting a bunch of groundskeepers early on, delaying greening for that reason, is really, really viable. Uh, because if your opponent gets a point lead, you can get a groundskeeper lead. And you can make up that point lead very quickly. Yeah, as long as they don't have a way to end the game. Right. that point where you don't that's have key. real points. That, that's key which, to this. Yeah, yeah, and that wasn't really an issue here if your opponent's yeah. not going for the same strategy. Yeah, Dutchy Duke is great for a lot of things, but it's not that great at ending the game on its terms in a timely manner. Yeah, no, that's his weakness. Dutchy Duke probably has like the highest point ceiling of any alt VP in the game, but like it has the least agency for ending the game. Yeah, uh, yeah, 
Um, the other thing is, like, and this is kind of helping out the Groundskeeper deck, but also kind of just, uh, in general, a cool thing. Like, Ironworks gets to be a real good card once you have your inheritance <laughs> token out. And, like, that's, that's really good with Groundskeeper, yeah, but also just in general. Uh, right, putting estates in the deck when you've inherited something good is super great, and Ironworks loves to gain estates that are also actions. Yeah. It's like uh, that Ironworks Island synergy, but... But good. With estates. Yeah. Yeah, but actually good. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, I mean, I think the the Duchy Duke deck is worth a few words, right? Like, what support did it have, and like, why did, why did we think that that was maybe going to be competitive? So, I mean, it's a good deck. If Groundskeeper or Chariot Race wasn't here, I think I'd probably still be playing that deck. I think it's competitive, at least, without one of those two here. I think it's very competitive with the deck. Um, sure. Yeah. I think Ironworks supports it very well. Also, Inheritance works pretty well. You can inherit Ironworks, and you can just flood with Silvers and stay viable. And that's usually what you did when you were playing that deck. Yeah, I, um, I tried a couple of different strategies for when and how to inherit, if I'm going for Duchy Duke, I tried for getting an early capital and getting inheritance right away. I really didn't like that line. Capital was just not a very good card for the deck anymore at that point. Oh yeah. So uh, I wasn't I wasn't too terribly pleased with that. I eventually had some more success with just getting some silvers and then hitting seven eventually. Uh, I mean, it's going to happen in that deck, and at that point, you inherit Ironworks, and then you just flood with silver and you go hard for green. And that deck really doesn't necessarily want to inherit Chariot Race because the like the other deck does because like it's not really I mean it's it's gonna it's not gonna turn down trashing a copper if it gets the chance to do it like for free, but it doesn't like in general Duchy Duke slogs don't want to trash copper that aggressively. I mean it depends on what else is going on. But. I mean I I didn't get a look out in that deck. Yeah. It so. just didn't seem like it was worth it. Ironworks, most of the time, makes you a dollar when you play it, because you're gaining a treasure. Yeah. And that's a big deal. Chariot Race is replacing itself, but um, that didn't seem to have as much value as gaining a thing. I mean, I would probably inherit Chariot Race in that deck if I had seven, and Ironworks wasn't around, but Ironworks is there. Yeah. So I did right. that. Yeah. I, I, I do want to say, this isn't an episode about Duchy Duke, so I'm not going to harp on it. Uh, scratch what I said about the copper thing. It's right. uh not true most of the time. Sure. Anyway. So yeah, it was, a, it was a fine deck, but it just didn't really compare to a properly played Groundskeeper Chariot Race deck. Yeah. Um, and then we tried a few games where we mirrored each other, uh, building a deck that was... Uh, oh, by the way, um, I think that we, we've kind of glossed over this, uh, but Expand, I think, was kind of important to the Groundskeeper Chariot Race endgame. Yeah, like, you get a capital to get that early inheritance. Yeah. But um, you also want to keep that capital around long enough to actually pick up and expand with it. Yeah. Expand's a great card for that deck because uh, once you have it, you can now get rid of your cap capital, which is no longer a good card for the deck. It can also help you uh, turn a province into province, which is fantastic if you have a bunch of Groundskeepers in play. I, well, it gains victory cards. Which is fantastic. Yeah. Also, it can uh, turn that nomad camp into something else. It can gain yeah. more groundskeepers if that's what you want. Uh, but you know, the nomad camp is a fine card for the deck until you get the expand, and then the expand can turn the nomad camp into something else, like a groundskeeper or maybe another expand, something like that. Yeah, I think it can turn like, your extra lookouts into better cards too once you're done thinning. No matter like no matter which one of these two decks we're talking about, you're building. I think that you. Uh, definitely do um, buy expand as soon as you can. Yeah, like it's my second seven after inheritance. Yeah. And I prioritize hitting that seven by yeah. making sure I keep my capital around if I have an ugly lookout decision. Like I would trash pretty much anything over that capital if it meant that I could hit seven and get expand. Because there's yeah, not really definitely. any other good way to do it without draw here. Yeah. Um, so now we're looking at. Uh, the, we looked at the Duchy Duke versus the Groundskeeper Chariot Race deck, and we've decided the Groundskeeper Chariot Race deck kind of comes out ahead. Uh, not kind of, it definitely comes it out ahead. Yeah. And then uh, we tried a few games of uh, mirroring each other with what we both thought was the best strategy. Um, and we tried to figure out, like, if you're being mirrored and contested in that deck, what's important? Um, I My thought is that the Groundskeeper split 
is actually what it really comes down to. Uh, it's important. Yeah. For sure. And actually, that's kind of the only time I advocate getting a potion, now that I've played it a few times, is oh. if you're being contested on Groundskeepers. Oh, I think the potion's way better if you're not being contested. I think, like, because I think you need to rush the Groundskeeper split. Um, not, like, rush it, like, start getting them immediately, <coughs> but, like, you get the best card for your deck, but I think, like, clutching out, like, getting one or two groundskeepers up on your opponent is, I think, a pretty big deal. Right, if you're contested, that's the case. If, yeah. If my opponent's going for Dutchy Duke, I'm definitely getting University, right? Uh, if my opponent's... Yeah, I mean, like, I don't know... I definitely know. It's oh. it's not close for me. Like, that's just the fastest yeah. way to get groundskeepers in your deck, and you want all of them ASAP. That's true, yeah. But, yeah, if you're mirrored, then it becomes a little crunchy... Because, uh, you know, your priority is getting Inheritance, but, like, do you get some Lookouts to Thin first, or do you get the Potion first? Sometimes, you know, you can get them both at the same time, and that's great. But which one you prioritize more? And, and I thought that getting a couple of Lookouts, you know, before Potion number one uh, was pretty good, and I stand by that. I think it, uh, I don't think it hurts you enough on the Groundskeeper split to pass up the tempo that it gives you by thinning, which I think is super important here. Yeah. Well, and, like, you're you're kind of forced to thin aggressively. Like, if my opponent doesn't thin aggressively, I can get some chariot races and punish that. But... Yeah. Um, yeah. So... Um, that's about how we played this kingdom out. Uh, charm was okay. I that's think, like, fine, I guess. grabbed a charm at some point, and it yeah. was... Uh, yeah, but anyway... Groundskeepers is a pretty good card. Good times. Yeah. Yeah. So is Inheritance. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Pretty decent. <laughs> yeah. So, so uh, we have our we have our lovely main topic for this episode. Yeah. What to do when there's no X. Uh, yeah, so what's your favorite kind of missing lunch meat? Hmm. All right, we can just move on. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> uh, I think that a lot of the time... When we're first reading a kingdom, uh, when we're set up a new game of Dominion and we're just trying to figure out what to do, what's going to be the best strategy, we have some boxes we're trying to check. Um, these boxes are like like a checklist of what makes what's going to comprise a viable strategy. It's like, uh, okay, find the draw, and then find the way to get control of your deck, the trashing and uh, find what the best turn is with extra gains, etc. So what we're going to be focusing on here is what do you do when you go down that checklist and one of those boxes is just missing? Like you've got maybe some other components, but it's not there. Yeah, I see a lot of people... Um, it's a very common thing that I see uh, to see someone who is nine or ten turns into the game, they finally yeah. have control of their deck, and they're like, all right, is there any plus buy here? <laughs> I'm a huge culprit of that. <laughs> I mean, it's, uh, <coughs> I think it's really important to go through that before the game begins, right? Because it affects your entire strategy. But I, I think it's important to, like, make sure you, you have a list of all the things, because there was just a really long time that I played the game, and I would just... I would miss one of them, and then I would get burned every once in a while because the board didn't have that thing, and I needed that thing, and yeah. I just forgot to check for that thing because there's a lot of things that you need to check. And so uh, it pretty much the start of every single one of my videos, I go through that list. I look for attacks, I look for defense, I look for trashing, then villages, then draw, then plus buy, and like I look for those things in that order. And I have a great reason for it, and like we we kind of did our episode yeah. about openings, and there's another episode about the analysis you do before a game begins, and like we can talk at length about that. But sometimes the answer to these things is no, and what do you do about it? And the answer is not always play money. <laughs> now, and here's why I say that um, we can look at this deck that's like chaining a bunch of kingdom cards together and uh, aiming to have these really big impactful turns um, and it needs certain things and then we compare that to what you would call a big money or a money strategy where we're just playing treasures to buy a province as often as we can. Now that strategy is noteworthy because one it's always available in every game. Yeah. 
and two, it is kind of a self-sufficient strategy apart from the kingdom. Um, it can definitely be assisted by the kingdom, big money can, but like it doesn't really need plus buy. It's just trying to hit eight and buy a province. It can often do it with five or fewer cards in hand, um, so it doesn't always need to draw cards, and it doesn't always need to play multiple terminals a turn. Um, so, it doesn't need to play actions on a turn. Right, it doesn't need to play actions. And like if it does uh, play actions, a lot of the time it just wants to play like one or maybe two. And so a lot of the time when uh, we are looking at a kingdom, if we decide that these limitations we're going to talk about are too severe, they're just there's no way you can make it work, I, you, we come back to this, hey, you can always play money instead. Uh, because that's always available. So when we're looking at these restrictions and talking about playing around them, the implication of playing around them is that that's to enable something that's better than that. That's to enable doing more than getting a province per turn or uh, having b a better deck than a big money deck could be. Right. Uh, normally it requires some resources to invest, like time and turns and buying cards and maybe trashing like yeah you have to go through some extra stuff to do that and you know in theory that puts you behind the big money player who might start greening before you so, yeah um you know of course you want to do that i mean if you didn't get to do that very much the game wouldn't be fun and spoiler alert game's fun so do that but uh you know knowing when to and when not to is important and and i think more importantly is knowing why you're not going to be doing these things. Yeah. I'll get definitely. done playing a game with someone and their deck didn't work and they don't know why. And being able to pinpoint if your deck's not working, why it's not working, is a really important skill for getting better at the game. Yeah. And so, I mean, we're going to go through the what in this episode, but the why is, I yeah. say this a lot, the why is so much more important because definitely. it allows you to be critical of your own play. It allows you to go out and be adventurous and build a deck that you're not sure if it's going to work or not. And if it doesn't work, you can identify why. Maybe <laughs> there was no village, or maybe the village sucked so much that it made the deck not work, for example. Yeah, definitely. Uh, the thing that you want to keep in mind as we proceed with this discussion is that, again, we're going to be talking about all of these things um, in ways that push you away from playing big money instead. Uh, but understand that if these things are too weak, the implication is that you play big money instead, right? Sure. So there's no village. That yeah. sucks. What do you do when there's no village? What does that uh, mean? Yeah, so um, I want to define village. Yeah. First thing you do when there's no village, is there really no village? <laughs> uh, make sure of that, because the things are village that don't necessarily say village on them. Right. Uh, a village is any card that allows you to play more than one terminal action in a turn. A terminal action is just something that doesn't give you any plus actions. Yeah. So I want to be able to play more than one terminal in a turn. I need a village to do that. Um, if you want more detail on what exactly a village is, um, I would actually recommend going to the uh, Dominion Strategy wiki page on villages. Yeah. Uh, we're going to link to that in the description, all the resources for this video. Normally I don't recommend the witty, the wiki, the witty, the wiki for s serious strategic advice because it's kind of hit or miss what you see. However, I last edited <laughs> the wiki page on that, so I know it's good, right? The best quality control for Adam Horton is Adam Horton doing it himself. Of course, I'm going to be happy with it. Of course, I'm going to recommend it to you. So I just did. I can't speak up. I, I just my voice is too weak right now. Yep. But otherwise, I'd be keeping him in check. It's yeah. not going to happen this episode. <laughs> um, I also had some. Help I don't know if you can hear me at all. By the way, go ahead. Oh, it should be fine. Yeah. So um, that's what a village is, and if we can't do that, then um, you only get one terminal action every turn. That's yeah. The basic limitation of Dominion: you get an action to start your turn. Uh, if you can't do more than one terminal, then you get one. Yeah. Now. When you uh, find yourself faced with that uh, situation where the cap is one terminal per turn, in my mind, the first thing you need to do is actually take a step back and challenge or, or rethink some of the things you may have already thought. What I mean by that is that like there are always going to be some cards, some like flashy attacks or payload cards that catch your eye. And one of the things I want to... Uh, remind you is that just because a card was good in a game you played doesn't mean it's good this game 
Notably, there are some terminal payload cards and attacks that get a lot less good when you can only play one of them in a turn. Like, I'm thinking about, like, Bridge and Bridge Troll, things like that. Like, if um, those cards get a lot less strong, and that's something you need to take notice of if there's no village. For sure. Um, so, so, like, what do you do in this situation? My focus turns away from those terminals now. Yeah. Because they get a lot worse. And it turns towards the non-terminals, right? The, the things that give me some plus action. Yeah, right. So, uh, notably, we're talking about, um, like, any kind of cantrip or non-terminal payload, yeah? So, yeah, cantrips are non-terminals, and, you know, cantrips are a little more relevant for the future of this episode, but, like, I care about things that are non-terminal, because I can play as many of those as I want, and then I get my one terminal per turn. So I select which terminal I want to be my one true terminal, and I think about all the non-terminals I can play and what I can do with just that subset of what's available in the kingdom. And And that could potentially limit what I can do. If my plus buy is terminal and I just get to play one of them, now I get two buys in a turn, never anything more. And this is the really important aspect of uh, understanding the why behind it that we keep coming back to because, like you notice, Adam and I just said two seemingly opposite things. I said, like, some terminals get a whole lot worse and uh, when there's no village. And then Adam's saying, uh, the terminals are really important when there's no village. But, like, basically what you need to do is think about what the implication of the terminal is. Don't just have this catalog of cards in your mind, like, this is a strong card. Uh, think about like what kind, what terminal uh, it is, and like what playing at a single time can actually do for you. Right. So I think, I mean, you can have some serious limitations if there's no village. Your payload can suffer. Your draw resources can suffer. Um, that's a big deal. Um, just because there's no village, I mean, that'll put you in that situation. There's some other ways, and this is sort of detailed on the wiki page as well, and I want to kind of to go over that. So, like, there's some villages that have some limitations. Like, the only village is Necropolis or Crossroads. Yeah. You're, you're not going to be able to get a whole pile of those cards and keep getting your village effect on every single one. So now I'm limited to two terminals or three terminals per turn, but that's still a hard cap. So it's the same question, just a little bit of a different context. Maybe two terminals a turn is enough. Maybe three terminals a turn is enough. Um, But you're still limiting your payload and your other draw resources by that limitation. So um, that's that's important, right? If your village has restrictions, it matters, even if there is the village there. Um, Or maybe the village requires some support that's not there. So I'm thinking, like... Herald, but you can't make it hit all the time. Yeah. You can't get the action density to make your Herald good. Then, like, do you really have the village? Well, you're not going to have the village a lot of the time, so you either need to be okay with the fact that your deck just doesn't work some of the time, or, I mean, you just don't play that deck, right? The village doesn't function well if you need that consistency. Definitely. I mean, uh, you might be looking to other options, and Uh, one of the other things that it's worth bearing in mind is like we talked about the importance of identifying which terminal you're going to prioritize and we talked about like how you only get to play one you also want to think about how many copies of it you're going to have right so like on one given turn I'm going to play a terminal but maybe that means I have more than one copy of that terminal in my deck so I'm thinking like just a mountebank slog where like I'm right. not going to have great control over my deck there's a lot of junk but it's still very important for me to play mountebank as often as possible right I'm going to get a lot of mountebanks to increase the chances of me playing a mountebank every turn and like don't get too sad if you see them collide like or it could be uh, even not something so uh, permanently damning as mountebank we could be talking about just like goons or whatever like if the game is about playing a single goons every turn by the way goons is great with villages also really good without but uh if you if the game is about playing a goons every turn i'm gonna get multiple copies of goons and i'm not gonna be too sad when they collide i'm gonna get as many as i need to play one as often as i want to play it yeah just Ideally, every turn. If you have the deck control resources to just have the one copy and play that copy every turn, like, great, do that. That's usually better. Right. But, like, 
that's kind of hard to do without a village, right? Yeah. It seems a little rare in that case. So yeah. when when it is that case and you don't have that deck control, you know, it's, it goes back to our cycling episode. Yeah. I care about playing this card a lot on my turns. What are the resources I have to do that? And spamming that card is one resource that I have to do that. Absolutely. I definitely, obviously, don't overdo it. Right, like you don't, <laughs> you don't like get the entire goons pile just because you can. Yeah, but if it's terminal. Uh, yeah, but uh, like, don't be afraid to over terminal just because there's no village. Because right. playing the missing a turn of playing the terminal is worse than having the two terminals collide in my mind. Most well, I mean, it would be better if you got to play it every turn and they never collided. Yeah, right. But, like, if, if you have the choice between <laughs> having to go a turn without playing that terminal or having the terminal collide with itself, I'm going to usually choose the collision. Sure. If the terminal is goons, I'm going to choose the collision. Yeah. It, if the terminal is woodcutter, <laughs> it's a different choice. <laughs> if that's your terminal of choice, uh, is like, you know, uh, Sacred Grove or... <laughs> it's just get a silver. It's okay. Silver's yeah. a fine card. Right. All right. So uh, so that's that's villages. Yeah. Uh, any more to say about when there's no village? Uh, no. That's about it. Cool. Um, just bear in mind the implications of it. Right. So uh, now let's say that there's no draw. This one's tough. Balls. I love that's draw. This one, there's a lot to talk about with whether if there's no draw, because that's probably the biggest limitation you can put on a board. I would think. Uh, yeah. I think the first thing we should do is define what draw is. Sure. Yeah. So draw is any combination of cards that will increase the number of cards you have in hand without decreasing the number of actions you have remaining. So like yeah. The, the pure example is lab. It gives you more cards. It doesn't decrease your actions. But village plus smithy would be draw. You play a village and you play a smithy, and you've increased the cards, but you still have an action left over. Yeah. Smithy without village is not draw. It requires the support of a village. And I actually, I have, like, a slightly different definition in my head of draw that overlaps quite a bit with this, and that's just, like, for me, draw is anything that increases the number of cards in my hand that I can play. So, like, I think about the difference between hand size and effective hand size when I think about that. So it's... But, yeah, yeah I mean, we're... down to basically the same... We're saying the same core. thing, pretty much, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, again, the wiki page on this... Uh, I did that too. <laughs> right before the episode, Adam just edited all the wiki pages <laughs> so they'd be ready for the episode. <laughs> uh, sure, that sure that happened for sure. So uh, yeah, we'll link to that as well. And there's a lot more detail on all of the cards that fit into that, just like there are for the village. Maybe. Yeah. So like, how much value can you get out of your turn in a game of Dominion? Fifty-five value. Yeah. Exactly. Indeed, it was a trick question because. <laughs> Uh, like, it's based on how... A lot of the time, it's based on how many cards you can play. And, like, the biggest in a turn... And so, like, the Adam, you always say, like, usually the person who plays more cards, specifically action cards, but just cards, is going to win the game. Yeah. So, like, the biggest limitation on how many cards you can play in a turn is typically how many you can see and have in your hand at any given time. Uh, yeah, putting more cards in your hand and then playing those cards is pretty good. Yeah. Now, like, I'm not going to tell... <laughs> that doesn't mean that your aim should be to put cards in your hand, right? <laughs> Correlation is not causation. Having a lot of cards in your hand and winning the game are both caused by having a good deck, okay? And we want to help you build a good deck. Right. <laughs> Just playing cards by itself doesn't make it. It's a, it's a symptom, right? It's, it's a symptom of having a good deck. And winning the game can be a symptom of having a good deck. Yeah. That's why they're correlated. You might start to get a, a really sore throat, and that's the symptom as well of having a good deck. Yeah, because you're like saying the name of each action card as you're playing it. Yeah, your voice gets kind of hoarse because you're you have to declare each action, yeah. and it just gets exhausting. Yeah, it's pretty rough. Yeah. So yeah, like uh, the draw is great, but like, what if there's no draw? That sucks. Yeah. What do you do then? So. Um, I mean, the my focus turns to the cards that don't negatively contribute to my draw. Sure. And those would be cantrips. Yeah, so, like, we talked about the amount of value you get out of your turn usually being correlated to the number of cards you can play on that turn. Uh, the, when there's no draw or way to increase your effective hand size, uh, at least the cantrips help you play more cards. Right. Cantrips are things that give you at least plus one card and plus one action. 
Yeah. They replace the card they took to initially draw it and the action they took to play the card. And so these are not taking away from your draw, and they're allowing you to continue to play more cards without the use of increasing your hand size. Now, this is a point where I really want to um, come in and highlight something when we talk about look for cantrips. We're looking for cantrips that positively contribute to your turn outside of being cantrips. We're not talking about spamming pearl divers. <laughs> um, There's no draw. Are we not? But I won the pearl diver split. Yeah. We're not, and like this doesn't ju- this this extends to less obvious examples too. We're also not talking about buying chariot races that you don't have a really good shot of winning. Like, just because there's no draw, or like, really, this applies all the time, but like, don't buy chariot races that you don't think you're going to win, or that you don't have a really good reason to think you're going to win. Sure. Um, Because like, you know, it has to help you in order to count as a card that you played, (laughs) in my opinion. Uh, for sure, uh, I guess that goes back to your effective hand size definition, <laughs> right? Well, yeah. I, I mean, drew a pearl diver. Woo! Yeah. So, um, I, I mean, you look for cantrips because you can play as many of those as you want without draw, uh, and then you also get the initial five cards you started your hand with. So I'm looking for five, and, and those are stop cards, right? Stop cards are cards that don't contribute to your draw. Yeah. So I'm looking for five stop cards. And I'm looking for cantrips, and mm, the awesome things I can do on my turn are capped by what are the cantrips and what are my five stop cards that I choose. Yeah, definitely. Kind of like the non-terminals plus my one terminal, it's now the cantrips plus my five stop cards. Yeah, and I'd say, like, if there is any, uh, and I already kind of went here, but, like, if there's any one limitation that is going to push you toward money or at least encourage you very strongly to build around it if there uh, if if there's um something better than money you think you can pursue it's this one it's the the lack of being able to put extra cards in your hand is the biggest limiting factor in the game i would agree i think this is a harsher limitation than any of the other stuff that we're going to be talking about this episode yeah definitely so um let's let's get into a little bit more detail here um so let's say that there are other draw-neutral things besides cantrips. So let's say there's festival and there's moat. I play a festival, I play a moat, and I'm back to five cards and I didn't decrease my actions. Now this isn't draw, because I didn't increase the number, yeah. but it also doesn't take away, like, it doesn't take away from my effective hand size. They're not stop cards when I play them. And That's I get, true. I get this benefit, right? Yeah, you got two coins and a buy out of that. And I have a bunch of moats in my deck that don't suck. Right. So that's that's not something to sneeze at. No, it's not. But um, I, I think I know what you're gonna say here. Yeah. And I'm gonna go ahead. I'm gonna preemptively agree yeah. with the words I'm gonna shove into Adam's mouth right now, which are that uh, that is amazing. No, I'm kidding. That's that's great, but it's probably not worth building around. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> like, <clears throat> yeah. I mean, this gets a lot less good. In fact, in the like, multiple thousands of games of Dominion I've played. I've never seen this be worth it, except for in one kingdom that was designed. Yeah. Like, so never. So yeah, never, never where it matters. Um, it's like definitely something that is not uh, totally to be ignored, but like you need to have another reason for doing it. If you are building around a lot of card neutral. Uh, hand size neutral card plays like you have to hope that there's some other payload that like gives you some compelling reason to do that it can't just the whole purpose can't just be to play the festivals and the moats or the faceful hounds or whatever because like that is probably going to get outpaced and lose to money uh, right it, it, you have to invest a lot to build it and since there's no draw I mean if you're going to put green cards in that deck eventually it's going to fall apart the issue with this is that the festival without the moat, or the moat without the festival, is a stop card. Yeah. Uh, it, doesn't it doesn't have the other component it needs. So you have to line these cards up. And in a deck without draw, it's really hard to line cards up. Yeah, like, you could have all of the festivals in your deck. Like, you could have all ten festivals. And all ten moats. But, or, like, you could have ten festivals and five moats. 
but you know me, I'm going to draw the five modes um, <laughs> so, uh, in my starting hand. So um, there, there's definitely a lot to be said about that. And without, um, without draw, it's really hard to line two cards up that have synergy like that. Yeah. Uh, I think something else to note is that um, you start with five cards in your hand, right? Except for all the times that you don't. Yeah. Uh, if there's a discard attack and there's yes. no draw, um, your limitation is now not five stop cards, but three stop cards. And I don't know if you knew this, Jake, but three is less than five by a lot. Uh, leave in the comments. I'm not sure about that. But yeah, um, let us know. Uh, yeah. Can you, you just hit us up? Uh, no, <laughs> we'll do that later. But like... Uh, it, it's a really <laughs> harsh thing to be dealing with that and, and what this really means, the main takeaway is that discard attack is way 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 stronger in this case than yeah. normal if there is no draw or the only plus cards is cantrips or there's nothing like that like even getting hurt with hit with like urchin which is usually like the most innocuous attack you know in, in the book um like, that hurts, oh, yeah. because, like, if your effective hand size was only five, losing a card really sucks, and I'd say the worst attack to get hit by um, that I can think of in a really draw-weak decks is Relic. Relic? Yeah, because not only are you losing a card, but, like, you're drawing one fewer of your really weak... Like, if you're relying on cantrips to draw and you uh, draw one fewer at the start of your turn, the expected value of your turn has just been like massively diminished if you get hit with a relic. Uh, I mean, that's like the same thing as getting hit by a minion, right? Uh, yeah, it's really... it's Okay, I minion, would, I would minion and be, relic. Okay, sure. I would rather be hit by a, uh, a relic than a minion just because uh, whenever I get minion attacked, it's worse than getting pillaged. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So. Yeah, so minion and relic in my <laughs> uh, minion and relic uh, are in my mind like the most brutal things to look for if uh, the draw is really tight. Uh, sure. I mean, they discard and that sucks. Yeah. So like that's no fun. I mean, they they all are really awful to be hit by, and so you you definitely want to do that on those boards. Um, I think we can't really talk about draw without talking about trashing. Yeah, so it's interesting. When we talk about trashing, a lack of trashing in a kingdom, or uh, thinning or whatever, controlling, getting rid of cards you don't want. The starting cards. Yeah. And a lack of uh, draw. Uh, those are two very mechanically different things in Dominion, and yet, when we talk about the implications that they have for your deck building, they're, they, we almost talk about them as the same because like they kind of end up meaning the same things. Yeah. Weak draw and weak trashing. Yeah, like, you have this limitation at the start of the game. You have ten bad cards in your deck. Yeah. And when I'm looking at kingdom cards, and I see all these amazing things I can do, I have this problem. I have ten problems. Seven of those problems are called copper, and the other three are usually called estates. Yeah. But sometimes yeah. they're called necropolis. You, you get what I mean. Sometimes they're called goat, or whatever. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Sure. So... I want to get rid of those because uh, if I have 10 starting cards and there's no draw, then it's really, really hard for me to, to find these two cards that work well together in the same hand. And it's even more ex <laughs> if uh, there's a junking attack. What? I don't think you said that word correctly. I heard exactly. Okay, well, we'll, uh, we'll censor that out. <laughs> the problem is even more exacerbated when... I'm a child, sorry. <laughs> when there's a junking attack, especially if you can't deal with those junks. But even if you can, uh, the trashing is very, very important. Yeah. If you can do it, and, you know, it's going to be a giant pain in your tuchus if you can't do it, or if it's a pain to do it. Yeah, so, like, the big impact that... Um draw and trashing have are uh, they let you have better the, or the cards you want to have in your hand more often. Yeah, those like, five cards you start with plus yeah. the cantrips, you get to choose those five cards a lot better yeah. if there's trashing than yeah. if there's not. And if there's draw or if there's not. or in, There's not some the five, form but... of cycling that allows you... like Right. If there's some form of cantrip cycling, which is rare and usually really good. I think it's only forum and cartographer. 
well, let's say cantrip cycling. Uh, yeah, I want to say you're right. I mean, maybe uh, that isn't draw. Yeah, that, sure. Yeah, cycling that isn't draw. So, like, I mean, storyteller doesn't count because yeah. they can draw cards. Yeah, I mean, I uh, would have to think about it. That sounds right, though. I'm sure we'll. Think of any, I'm uh, sure we'll find a few more, and then we'll talk about them at the start of next episode. Awesome. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So, it, it, they're really important to control your deck and have the cards you want to have in your hand. Right. So, like, I mean, we've talked about if there's no draw, and we sort of ta started talking about trashing. If there's no trashing, but there is draw, uh, you can make up with that with really strong draw. Yeah. You just draw those ten starting cards and whatever junks you get. Yeah, so like there, there is this uh, kind of fantasy, uh, well, and not fantasy, because sometimes it happens, um, unlike winning chariot races, uh, but like where you are don't have to trash any of your starting cards, or like you couldn't, but you make up for it by drawing everything anyway. Right, and like drawing cards is super great. Um, the the issue there, I wouldn't say it's an issue. The things you're looking for to make that deck a lot better are forms of cycling that help you with consistency. Yeah. Right. I want to find those draw cards so I can actually have good turns as often as possible. So I'm I'm just looking for other forms of cy cycling like top decking or some form of reliability, and, and we go into a lot of detail about that in the cycling episode. So I guess, you know, just refer you to that. We'll link it in the description. Yeah. So I think if you're if you're going to run into an issue here, if these resources aren't enough in the ways that we've said, um, I, I think you got to play big money. Like, well, okay, such so a harsh limitation if you can't make something happen. Yeah, and like this, what th this next part applies even like if you're playing big money to like a certain flavor of big money, or even if not, like if you uh, don't have draw or trashing and there's no way at all to cycle past the uh, kind of junky cards that you don't want to be playing, then that, uh, in my mind, pushes you away from building toward a consistent deck. It pushes you away from a lot of the conventional deck building um, that we've come to associate with Good Dominion and pushes you toward building to like a big spiky turn, even like if it's like inherently inconsistent. Like I'm talking about like maybe you can't uh, get a province every turn because the board is just that sloggy and that difficult, but like you can play a tactician and get one every other turn. Or something like a uh, wine merchant, or maybe like you spend half your turns buying expedition and the other half buying stuff. Um, so if there is no deck control whatsoever, sometimes these really spike... Or capital is another actually great example. There are sometimes these really spiky resources that can get you toward your win condition in spite of how bad your deck is. Sure. So, I mean, the examples you gave are great. They're great for real games of Dominion. Uh, half of them are draw. Well, so we're sure. starting to move away from the what to do if there's no draw. Yeah, right. And I, I think mean, we're kind of combining the whole like oh there's no village there's no draw like if those deck control resources are restricted you know that does color the way you look at the rest of the kingdom and it makes different things good definitely so i mean we've talked pretty much exclusively about deck control resources up until this point sure and i mean knowing what your limitations in deck control we've we've already talked about how these directly correlate to limitations in your payload for that turn and, you know, when I'm looking at payload, when I'm looking at cool things to do, I, I need to have those deck control limitations in the back of my mind so that I don't think that I can play 10 bridges when I can't draw 10 bridges and I can't get the actions to play those bridges. Definitely. So um, now through the lens of our deck control, we want to look at our payload. And so now that I think this is sort of the last of the what to yeah. do if there's no X. And now X is going to be a way to get more than one province per turn. Yeah, definitely. Um, that is kind of something that splits games of Dominion into two categories for me. That's uh, one of the first things I look at is like, which kind of game of Dominion am I playing today? Is this a game where I am trying to um, get as much value out of my turns as possible every turn? Or am I trying to hit eight as early and often as possible? And, like, you know, the two categories for me are, like, can I do better than a province per turn, or is a province per turn the best turn I can have? Right. 
So and we're talking about colonies too, yeah. Of course. Right. Yeah. So um, one thing you look for is plus buy, right? If there's plus buy, yeah. then you can buy two provinces in a turn if you have enough money to do that. And, yeah, and that's great. That's the canonical example. It's right. The one that came in the base set. That's right. Uh, there are other ways to get more than one province in a turn. So don't just look for plus buy. <laughs> yeah, it, there was, there. I'm embarrassed to say there was a time in my Dominion uh, play career, what have you, where I would immediately look at a kingdom, and if I didn't see the word plus buy anywhere in the kingdom, I'd be like, all right, this is big money, let's go. I lost a lot of games of Dominion that way, and um, I wear those on my sleeve. So yeah. So like, I'm looking for ways to gain provinces or colonies without buying them so like we sure. remodel gold into province Woo, we did it and we can gain more than one province per turn yeah um, or i'm also looking for other sources of points that are enough to compete with provinces in terms <coughs> of like how much vp you're generating so i'm looking yeah. towards like vp tokens or distant lands or some other green card that just can get you a high number of points i'm not looking at mill like, if I can get a province and a mill every turn, and I took three more turns to build, I'm going to lose because mill is only one VP. Yeah. I need a lot of points. However, if you can get a province and a mill every turn, and you did it at the same speed as the guy who is just getting a province every turn, then, like, you know, you definitely yeah. capitalized on that. Yeah. So, I mean, we're looking for... I mean, two provinces or more in a turn is really, really great. And yeah. And that is frequently worth building towards if it is possible. Definitely. Um, what if there's not, right? That's the whole point of this. Well, the, yeah, right. So, like, this is how you, uh, how do you maximize your edge or the value you get out of your turns or just your likelihood to win the game if uh, the best thing that you or your opponents could do every turn is just buy a province. And uh, we get into one question is, like, do you have a reason to build a lot? And I think, like, the main reason you uh, keep building your deck after you're able to hit eight, the, the only reason to keep building at that point would be to establish consistency. Uh, that's one reason. Yeah. I'm not going to say it's the only reason. Sure. But it's a big reason. Like, big money doesn't hit eight every turn. Yeah. So, Whereas, like, big money with some support from the kingdom might hit eight every turn. Or maybe a deck that I invest a little more time into building. Yeah. That can hit eight every turn. Now, at this point... And we're, we're looking at this in the frame of a kingdom that uh, only lets you get one province per turn. At this point, I really want to stress something that I feel like a lot of players forget, and that is that consistency has diminishing returns in your deck building. Um, once you... If you are building a deck that gets to 90% likelihood of buying a province every turn. There's like a 10% likelihood to stall, and I can take like a 20% likelihood to stall and just start greening a turn before you. I'm really confident about my odds of winning that game. I mean, a, a lot of times you're going to be starting more than one turn also. Right. So, um, so just remember that there is limited value in consistency, especially yeah. when we are talking about gaining a province every turn. For sure. Um, so yeah, consistency I think is really important. I think consistency along with speed is something yeah. that's definitely worth building towards. Um, so you want to you wanna have more consistency at getting your provinces when you're building this deck than just treasure flooding. And right. maybe treasure flooding is buying treasures or maybe getting you know, a whole bunch of them. Maybe you save up for a big masterpiece, whatever. Yeah, or like... Uh, you know, I'm playing Apothecary Native Village or something. That's a consistent deck that's really fast to set up, but it yeah. plays very differently than Big Money. So consistency along with speed, I think, is something that's that's really great. Consistency along with speed, I mean consistency without sacrificing too much speed. Definitely. And that that's the same point as he made uh, on diminishing returns yeah. for consistency. Right. I think the other big thing you want to look for is attack cards. Definitely. Attacks uh, are very, very much a concern. Um, and actually, like, usually the attacks are even highlighted by the things that we talk about in this episode, if you notice. Like, a lot of what we come back to is, like, how can you take this limitation of the kingdom 
and use that to like accentuate the attacks you might play on your opponent. So in a way, you can say if I'm attacking my opponent, I'm decreasing their consistency. Right? I'm yeah, making it right. less likely that they can province because I play a militia on them every turn. Yeah. Or I've given them all ten purples. Right. So, I mean, this is another lens to view consistency as, but I, I think there's a point here to be made. Pretty much every attack card in the game is going to be more effective if you can play it more often, like every turn. Yeah. So, I care about <coughs> playing that attack every turn enough yeah. because it makes my opponent's deck much worse. Uh, and I care about doing that enough that I want to build my deck to the point where I'm able to play that attack consistently. Yeah. Now, how much time and energy you are willing uh, to spend of your deck building doing that, um, in my mind, I think like there are two considerations you need to uh, look for. Uh, one is, like, are there attacks that could get to like a critical mass point where if you build enough into them, you could slow your opponent down indefinitely? And those are rare. I'm thinking about, like, knights. Right. Yeah. I was thinking village torture when you're playing yeah. Lord Raddington, and he always discards no matter what. <laughs> right. Or like, like or, like, torture can effectively be that against a human opponent, too, because it's like, yeah. if they're not willing to take all ten curses, which, like, probably not, um, <laughs> then, uh, yeah, you can, like, kind of indefinitely lock them down that way. Yeah. You need to play multiple tortures in a turn. But, you right. know... If you have the village, maybe there's no way to get more than one province. This is still worth building for because of the attack. Definitely. And then the other category, which is really related, uh, but slightly different in my mind, is uh, attacks that aren't going to indefinitely pin your opponent down or, or slow them down, but are going to slow them down more or as much as it took you to invest in, in building to playing them. Like, yeah, it's it's about how how much they can deal, how much they have to build in order to continue having a good deck in spite of those attacks. Right. That's really important to consider because some attacks in that context are not worth it. Right. If I play a militia and my opponent can just play a jack of all trades, right. <laughs> it, exactly. It was not worth building the deck that can play militia every turn because all my opponent has to do is get like a third or a fourth jack and he's yeah. fine. He's or, still promising. Or, like, if I'm playing familiar and I am giving you curses every turn, but you have some effective way to trash them, even mildly effective way to trash them, bear in mind, I took a lot of time building that because I bought a potion and then I bought the familiar and then I shuffled the familiar and didn't drew it. And it didn't do anything except give you that curse. And if you trash it, that may have set me back like two turns, or it only set you back one. The, the big offenders here are Sea Hag and Ig, and we did a whole episode about that. Definitely. So, like, if there's any way to trash those curses, you know, the trashing took less opportunity than to do it. So, like, those are not enough to yeah uh, make me want to build a deck that revolves around that, uh, unless it's going to be more effort for my opponent to clean up. So, um, one of, the the point is you typically want to build more on boards with attacks, but you know you want to watch what you're building towards. Do I want to build towards playing that attack every turn because it's debilitating, or do I want to build towards having a functional deck in spite of that attack being played on me consistently, or, or both? Or yeah, I mean, is there a third option where I build a deck that can rush and end the game so quickly that I uh, win before my opponent gets to critical mass with his attack? I mean, that seems really hard to do when there's no way to get more than one province in a turn. <laughs> it does, now that I say it out loud, but, uh, you know, it's not impossible, I guess. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, we are talking about uh, the possible advantages and the edges that you look for when there is only uh, the capacity to gain a province per turn or a colony or whatever. Like, you and your opponent both have... Uh, the capacity to gain this one game-winning green card a turn. Um, and you're looking to get some advantage over him. Uh, and you're not seeing any uh, it scoring advantage in the kingdom. One thing to look for is that is pile control. Um, there is implicit value in that case in being able to empty multiple cards out of the supply on your turn. So... Like, I'm talking about 
uh, the maybe you are not able to draw to the point that you could use salvager in order to uh, get plus buy and buy two provinces in a turn, but you are able to salvage a province and buy a single province, and you've emptied two out of the supply or something of that nature. Like if you are able to empty two green cards out of the supply and your opponent is only able to empty one, you have a really big advantage even if you're scoring the same amount every turn. I feel like you have that advantage only if you have more points. Yeah, that's a really, really good point, is that when you're building for pile control like I'm talking about, um, that pile control needs to come quickly enough or uh, be effective enough in other ways that it didn't slow you down to the point that you're behind a province by the time you get there. Right. Um, Being able to end the game is only good when you can have more points. Right, yes. <laughs> Um, so I think that we've pretty well gone into what the different limitations you might be faced with in a kingdom and how to uh, interpret those in terms of uh, how your strategy works out and whether or not it pushes you to play money instead. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um, why don't we take a look at a kingdom to reinforce these concepts, huh? Definitely. Yeah. Um, what's All right. Let's, uh, let's, let's bang this one out. So we have Stonemason, Familiar... Shanty Town, Tunnel, Silk Road, Temple, Baker, Mandarin, Puka, <coughs> Witch, and there's Colonnade and Fountain. One more time for our audio only listeners Stone Mason, Familiar, Shanty Town, Tunnel, Silk Road, Temple, Baker, Mandarin, Puka, Witch, and there's Colonnade and Fountain. Yeah, so one thing I just realized about this kingdom is that the number of different openers that you could have... Oh, that is cursed gold. ...and the baker token. Oh, boy. <laughs> like, you, you can open with any card. To, <clears throat> you can open I'm, with province, man. Yeah, I know. I'm we fine. can do it. Actually, you could. That's hilarious. You could open province. Province and get a stonemason with it, and then you could stonemason the province into two golds. There we go. That's awesome. That's yeah. terrible. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, so, so there's no plus buy. Yeah. Uh, if I'm looking for ways to get more than one province in a turn, I'm not seeing it. The only extra gains here are stonemason, and you can't get extra <clears throat> provinces with that bad boy. Right, and like the only village for draw here is Shantytown, and yeah, Shantytown. The only town, village is Shantytown. Yeah, well, right. So the only village I said for draw because like the purpose of it is to enable the cards that draw, like Puka and Witch, which which attacks your opponent too. Uh, I guess. And Shantytown's got that identity crisis going on where it where it's a bad card. Yeah, it's a village, but <laughs> it doesn't want to be a village. It wants to be. It doesn't want to be enabling actions. It wants to be drawing cards. Uh, yeah, Shantytown's not a great card. So if I'm looking for draw here to increase my hand size, I'm either counting on Shantytown to draw me cards, or I'm playing a Shantytown and then a Puka, and I've increased my hand size by one in that case. So that sounds like a giant pain to do. So yeah. yes, you can do it, but it's not really sustainable, because it's hard to keep gaining those coppers. I mean, you can do it, but it's hard. And, sure. Uh, I mean, it like, sucks. Yeah, like you could. Oh man, you have to, I'm like, thinking line, about like you have to like line all these cards up, and that's hard to do because there's I mean, junking and the trashing is really weak. Yeah, I mean, Temple is pretty good, but I mean, still. It's well, a yeah. Pain. So I'm not worried about necessarily uh, getting con. Lo I'm sorry. I'm worried about getting control of my deck in a meaningful way. I am not worried about losing control of my deck due to junk cards coming in. Like, because the temple alone, in my mind, is probably enough to make me not super scared of witch. Um, temple is something I want. Oh, and I'm not buying familiar. Yeah, uh, well, I mean, because seven. witch is here, you can open with witch pretty much no matter what here. So yeah. I want to do that, and I think that makes familiar bad, <clears throat> even with the stonemason synergy. Yeah, okay, opening with witch is probably real good. Right. If you couldn't open with Witch no matter what, I would think harder about Familiar than still not get it. But it's definitely not good here because of Witch. I, I'm, I really want to open with a Witch. Uh, I really want to open with a Temple. Hopefully I can do both of these things. Sure. There are actually very few draws where I can't. So it, it seems like I want to do those things. Yeah. 
I want to I want to get the bad cards out. Those bad cards are potentially cursed gold, estates, curses. Mm -hmm. I want to put good cards in. Uh, good cards are baker and I think treasure cards. Uh, fountain is a thing, and I really yes. want to keep my coppers. So that's interesting. I mean. Do I want to keep my coppers just for fountain points? I don't know. So I think that I I think bakers are gonna pile here. Well, um, I mean, I I don't know what's gonna pile, but I mean, bakers a good card for the deck. It will colonnade points if nothing else. I think bakers are probably gonna pile. Maybe um, they will. I have no idea. So I, if I'm if I'm gonna open, um, if I can open with seven, I'm probably gonna go with like stonemason, baker, witch. Hmm. That's that's the best opener I can think about right now. And then um, okay. on hopefully I can maybe get a shanty town with that. I don't know. Ugh. I don't really like shanty town. So like there's two directions I'm being pulled here. Direction number 1 is I want to slog, I want to get those fountain points, I want to keep on top of the curses, but I want to just be getting a lot of points with fountain province and maybe some other green cards. That's that's one direction. It seems hard to hit province, though. One direction. Well, I mean, there's Baker. You'll eventually do it. And you want a lot yeah. of treasures. Uh, I, I was trying to make a one direction joke, but uh, Sorry, the I, comedic timing's gone. So Yeah, I came in with some uh, questions about the Dominion. Game. I blame you, Zane. It is your fault that one direction is not... Okay, so anyway... Watch, uh, he's like, listens to the podcast. He's like, screw you, Adam Horton. Uh, um, okay, <laughs> if, if any member or former member of One Direction listens to the podcast, I really hope it's Harry Styles, because he's my favorite member of One Direction. Wow. You know why? I don't even know who that is. Well, he's the... F your favorite, favorite member of One, of one yeah. Direction, yeah. So the reason, um, the reason he's my favorite is because his name is Harry, and he's the one most desperately in need of a haircut. And, like, you just can't make that up. <laughs> So anyway, the other direction I'm thinking about is, like, what can you do that's more than one province per turn? And I'm thinking it's get a province and maybe play temple? Eh, it's VP tokens. Maybe make a deck that plays a lot of temples and gain some temples. I don't know. I'm not sold on that deck. I think it's better to gain provinces and get fountain points. That's because yeah. the deck control resources are so bad. And so that payload of play a lot of temples is viewed through the lens of my poor deck control. Really, I just want to make sure I don't take all the purples. I want to make a decent deck. I want the fountain points, and I think provinces is enough for me to, to win the game. Well, possibly. I mean, one thing that uh, you see when you think you think when you see Stone Mason is pile out. Like if you are ahead, if you get a points lead here, um, it's not crazy to think that you could make piles evaporate using Stone Mason. You're correct. So part of my strategy will be to make sure that I have some points. Yeah. So, so like, um, fountain helps. Yeah. Right. Um, and I mean, you can you can get them off of uh, the colonnade points as well, or, or point chips you're getting from temple, possibly. Um, cursing your opponent is another way. I do have to wonder if just building a more straightforward deck that gets control of itself, gets some bakers, and tries to buy a province as ever as uh, often as possible is going to um, have a pretty good shot against what you're talking about, too. That's basically the deck I'm talking about. I think you're talking about slogging with Silk Road. No, not necessarily Silk Road. I mean, okay. slogging with coppers. Oh, okay. Not I'm like sorry, when you say the word slog and, and, and Silk Road is in front of me. <laughs> uh, sure, I mean, this is the problem about <coughs> the words engine and big money and slog are not well defined. We're working on yeah, it. Yeah, right. Um, okay, yeah, so that is a deck that is probably pretty strong. Um, yep, I think that's the best deck here. Yeah. Um, now, the question of whether or not you want to keep your coppers. I mean, that's 15 points, man. That's so many points. That's 15 points, but it's coppers also not even a, bad a deck. lot of lost consistency. And Wait, what do you mean? I'm playing bakers, man. Well... Yeah, but like you're not playing your bakers as often. You're not seeing your bakers as often. So every if I if I trash on the fifteen points, I know, and that's a lot of points. And like if you can that's leverage like that no pile out, that's a big deal. But like I am definitely not gonna uh, give uh, 
I'm not going to take any credence away from trashing the coppers and building more consistently. All right, I will. Bring it. All right. <laughs> Cage match. Well, that's kind of what we do every week, isn't it? Um, so. Yeah. Yeah, let us know what you would do in the comments. Um, would you be playing around Fountain, or would you instead be uh, trying to ignore Fountain, uh, trash your coppers? Are you going to prioritize getting colonnade points at any point? Um, do you see any creative uses of stonemason? Um, I don't see a whole lot to do with tunnel, but maybe you have some ideas about Silk Road. Uh, let us know uh, what you think, and... Other than that, we'll see you next time. Yeah. Hit us up. Uh, there's the Discord channel. The, uh, the AdamHorton.com the blog has links to all of this stuff. We'll comment on the YouTube. Our contact information is there on the blog. Let us know what you think. We care about that. We heard from some of you. We want to hear from all of you. Thank you for doing that. Thank you for listening. Definitely. Okay. And bye. That's why Werewolf is OP. Yeah, plus, like, if you play Werewolf and draw three werewolves, you're really happy. Yeah. Can't that's, say that about... That's how you measure any card. Yeah. If you, if you play that card and you draw three <coughs> more of that card, how you feel is how good that card is. Yeah, like, if I played a chariot race and I drew three more chariot races, I would I'd wonder... i really happy. Like, did I have two pathfinding tokens on chariot race? Yeah. I, mean, I would feel cards. like cheating, and so that's why chariot race is, is really good, because it's just like cheating. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah.